Nobody really talks about what's next, except Dorian does a little bit now. But uh, it's, it's hard retiring from something you're so active in and, and you love so much and something you're, my mind was into the Olympia for 10 years, for 10 years, and even before that, for, I don't even talk about the 25 years before that of getting ready to get to that point where you have 10 Olympias in your, in your view, okay? But when you retire, it's like, what do I do now? Who am I? You know, we're talking about Joseph Wilcox. Uh, he had some issues retiring. Dorian had some issues retiring. Ronnie Coleman had some issues retiring. It's hard to retire, but you don't know what to do. You know, what am I going to do? And am I going to get a job like a regular person? I thought about that. In fact, I did. I decided that rather than going to Arnold and saying, look, I need a job, you know, I wanted to do it myself. I wanted to know what it was like to be the average working guy. Okay? So I went to a corporation, put my suit on, and I said, I'd like to get a job in your corporation here. What kind of experience do you have? Nothing. My resume is, my resume is like, well, he spoke to presidents of different countries. He was a you know, world-class competitor. And it doesn't really matter. What experience do you have in the corporate world? I said, very little. And, and I said, but I'm trainable. He said, show me. I can do this. I can do anything. The same attitude I had in the squat rack for all those years. I thought to myself, if it worked in the gym, why won't it work in business or the corporate life? And I got to tell you, it did. It worked really, really well to where putting a suit on every day and putting my tie on was like my new gym. I was excited to get up at five in the morning and, okay, put my suspenders on. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go to the office. I'm going to be around all these young people, 20 and 30 year olds. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to walk in circles around them. Okay. And I did. It was like my new squat rack. My desk, my office was like my home. You know, I got promoted over the years, okay, uh, but I enjoyed working for merchant services. I was a corporate recruiter. My job was to identify talent and give them a job, but I had to interview them, uh, introduce them to other department heads, and find a place for them. I wasn't a headhunter. I was a corporate recruiter for a very, very large company, okay, and I, I loved it to death. I really did, but the same energy that I learned here in the gym, here in the squat rack, I took to the corporate workplace and it works. It's no different. The only difference is in the corporate workplace, when you see red, you can't respond. When you see red, you got to wait till it goes to pink. I, I sort of got in trouble a few times going, you, you know, okay. You, you can't do that when you're, uh, you can do it in the gym. I was paid a lot of money to respond like a crazy guy in the gym and I did real well, but it didn't work in corporate life. So I had to learn how to adjust that side of my personality, but I enjoyed it immensely. So for about, oh, I don't know, many years, for a good side of a decade or more, uh, I played the corporate person. And I thought that bodybuilding was my past. It was my past. I was a young man back then and I moved on in life and you start, you know, assuming a different role. You know, I'm now in corporate world and I talked to the CEO and they didn't know my background. They did learn my background and they go, we know who you are. What are you doing here? You know, and I said, I want to learn. I want to learn everything about this corporate world. Show me, you know, and I love staying, doing overtime, staying later. I wanted to learn and the bosses, the seat would take me. I'm going to take you to my office. So I'm going to show you how I talk to all these companies. I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to learn like I was a student all over again. Sometimes you're a teacher and sometimes you're a student in life forever. OK, so I, the same attitude I had when I was a teenager and I hung out with Arnold, got to, went to the beach with Arnold and, and it was introduced to Frank Zane and Robbie Robinson and, and all these guys and Lou Ferrigno, and I was a little kid learning. I took that same attitude into the corporate world, and it worked. I wasn't talented. I wasn't talented in bodybuilding. I didn't have a, any genetics. I didn't have any, I wasn't talented in business. But the thing is, I, I was telling David about this earlier, I had this attitude that I can do it. There's nothing I can't do. If I can squat 400, 535, or how many, I don't know, 23, whatever it was, I can do anything. I believed that. And it worked because I believed it. So I never, I'm telling you, I never had any talent for bodybuilding. I never had any talent for business. Uh, I wish I did. And I emulated guys and watched guys that were really sharp. My CEO taught me a lot. Uh, but I had David and I uh, and Matthias, who's here tonight, he's, he's filming. We did a video in LA uh, for uh, Team Andro. 
went crazy viral, which opened the doors for my brand to work again. And pretty soon I'm getting offers to go and teach all around the world. And I'm telling my boss, look, I got to leave for a month, okay, to go do some seminars. They're like, what? You can't. Who leaves for a month? Their corporate position. But it started opening up to where I said, God, I could go back to bodybuilding as a teacher and do seminars all over again and get involved in other projects and really give back to the sport that given me so much. Bodybuilding gave me a life. I'd be some homeless guy in Detroit if it wasn't for bodybuilding. It gave me a life. So right now, it's not about the money. I don't care about the money. It's not about gaining position as a bodybuilding player in the business. It's about just giving back to something that really gave me a lot, gave me a life. And that's the reason I'm here. That's the reason I've joined with Adam and uh, as far as working together. And my goal, our goal, is to go around the world one more time before I actually settle down. I'm 62 years old. I'll be 63 soon. By the time I'm 70, I'm not going to be doing this. I don't see myself traveling, you know, four different countries a week. No, but we're doing it now. And it's exciting. It's fun. It's hard. And, but I like being uncomfortable. Another thing that Squat Rack told me is, taught me is when you're uncomfortable is when you grow. We know that from the gym. When you're uncomfortable is when you grow. So I like being uncomfortable in life. I threw myself into a corporate position to where I didn't know anything. I had to learn the computer. I had to learn how to type fast. I had to learn how to pro all do these programs. I had no training. I'm like, I'm like a handicapped kid, you know. I'm an old man, but I learned it. I learned it. I learned it. And I got faster and faster and faster to the point to where I could live in a corporate world. But I decided to come back home. My CEO told me, he said, if you don't take advantage of this opportunity, go back to what you know best. I'm going to fire you anyhow. He was joking, but... It's like being in the mob. Once you get in the mob, you can't ever get out. You know, you're in it for life. And uh, is that, I don't know if that makes sense to you. The mob, meaning the crime syndicate, meaning like the Sopranos. Once you get into the Soprano family, so to speak, you can never get out. And that's bodybuilding for me. Bodybuilding has given me a lot, a tremendous a life. It's been good to me financially, mentally, spiritually, physically. Um, I learned about life in the gym. Everything I know about life, I learned at the squat rack. I learned how to fail in the gym. I learned how to fail and fall on my face many, many times that you never read about, okay? And I keep getting up. And the same attitude working in the office. I'd fail every day. I mean, I'm like all these 20-year-old kids around me typing. I'm like, my heart rate's fast. I'm losing weight. I can't eat enough. It's like, you know, I'm getting in shape just sitting there at my desk, you know? But I had to learn it. And I had to put myself in that position. And that's the reason... I'm in Europe 10 months out of the year, 11 months out of the year now because it's, it's uncomfortable. And that's when you grow. It's hard to learn a new language, but I want to do stuff that I've never done before. I want to feel so uncomfortable I can't stand it, but I want to be able to manage it. I don't want to have a nervous breakdown, but that's why I have Adam here. Adam watches me and says, okay, that's enough. But, uh, you know, I'm very fortunate. I've been very... Uh, fortunate in life and bodybuilding has been great to me but what I'm here, to, I'm here to tell you is that life doesn't happen to you we all think that life happens to me right life happens for you it happens for you I mean opportunities will come to you every day it's either for you you can remain scared of the opportunities or you can embrace them and take them my, my what I finally realized that and I want to share this with you if you give up on your dreams, if you give up on your dreams, what do you have left? <laughs> Nothing. I can't live that way. I can't live that way. I have to live on the edge. You know, if it wasn't bodybuilding, I'd probably be a motorcycle or cross country jumping cars or something. I don't know, something crazy. But uh, that's why I'm in this business. It's never been about the money. It's always been about the love of the game and the energy I gained from it. And... Uh, that's really, you know, when it's about the money, you get in trouble. Money should be a side effect to what you love to do. And that's what I bring to the gym every single day. And that's what I work, when I work with Sergio Oliva Jr. and other body, top guys and guys you don't even know, and David Hoffman, that's what I try to bring to the table. That energy and that thirst of where it's not just about, oh, I hope I do well. It's like you have to want the success in the gym as, one as, you, as much as you want to breathe. Okay? As much as, if you were gonna, if, if you started suffocating in this room, you'd find every way to get out of here. You'd be knocking the doors down, yelling, screaming, breaking windows, whatever you gotta do to live, right? 
That's what I brought to the gym. I don't know why this happened to me. It was a gift. I didn't have a choice. In 1970, or date myself, 1977, we all, I went to Gold's Gym, 50 bucks and a plane ticket. We all went to Gold's Gym like anointed zombies. Anointed zombies. We didn't care about the money. All we wanted to do was train together in the same gym. The fitness industry back in 1977 was 15 people. 10 guys, five girls. That was the fitness industry. It was great. The old Gold's Gym was like, oh my God, the energy was so thick. You walk in the door and you just, you couldn't stand it. You didn't even need to eat it. You needed to sleep. And the best in the business were there. I, th I decided as a young man that I have to go to California to be around the best in the world. I have to study with the masters. I wanted to study with the best in the, in the world because I felt that if I was around Arnold and Zane and Robbie and Ferrigno that the energy would rub off and it did and it did okay and that's so again it's not about the fact that you're not talented enough in fact forget about genetics to hell with genetics really you know I always tell people you know when I was a young man I said that I will not be a victim to my genetics I will not be a victim to my genetics I don't care I don't care, I, have a, I don't have a small waist. Hell with it. My genetics will be a victim to me. That was my, my plan. And it was my, my, God gave me this mentality. I don't know why, it gets me in trouble lots of times too. It does, okay? But God gave me the leg thing. I, I, I gotta tell you, most of those squats I did, I wasn't doing it. It wasn't me, it was God finishing the last 10 reps, okay? Because I, I don't know, I, I was done. You know, when I did, when at FIBO in Cologne, when we did 23 with five something, I mean, I, w I was done at 10, and uh, at 15, I thought it was all over, and the last, you know, seven reps, I don't know, eight reps, I don't know where it came from. Yeah, some, God was pulling up that weight, okay? <laughs> he was. And the only thing I can think of is that it's the opportunity that I was given. I mean, I didn't, I didn't wait for it to come. I had to take action. I had to do something to get it, and I had to go after it and embrace the heat, so to speak, uh, but, you know, there's been a lot of tough days where I question whether this is what I should be doing for a living. Now, 40 some years later, I mean, I've been bodybuilding for 40, 40, let me see, started when I was nine, so, you know, some 50, <laughs> so over 50 years, you know, but it's been everything I wanted it to be. I never got the Sandow trophy. I wanted that Sandow trophy. Yes, I had a trophy cabinet made for the Sandow. Um, but I would not train, I would not trade what I do have from the sport for the trophy. The trophy should give you what I have. Uh, what I have is I have the ability to still work. I'm still working in this business after losing the 81 Olympia. I didn't win. I failed at winning the Olympia. I'll repeat myself. I failed at winning the 81 Olympia, but I'm still working. 35 years later, still doing seminars, still doing stuff in the industry. So again, I, don't, I think it's really an attitude, an attitude and an energy that sort of I figured out or God gave to me, I don't know, or both, that it's allowed me to live and prosper very, very well, okay? And uh, it's not about the stuff. I mean, I, I thought for, at one time it was about Hoover had the most money and the most stuff and the BMW and the Porsche and, you know, the house on the East Coast and the house on the West Coast. I thought whoever had that was the winner. I got to tell you, when I had the most stuff, I was not the most happiest as I am now. Okay? In fact, I simplified my life. We, you know, we moved all of our belongings to Europe. Imagine taking everything you own and having two different houses and giving stuff away, selling stuff, and still you have giant, these big containers, all the pictures and photographs, and, you know, it's, it's a big process. But sometimes when you have too much, you need, you need to do less. You need to have less. And by having less stuff, I find things are much more clear for me now. And that's why I'm here. And that's why I've been doing seminars and getting involved in bodybuilding, so to speak, uh, as more of a mentor figure, so to speak. I had Arnold, I had Draper, I had, I remember, God, I remember when I first went to the 78 Mr. Universe, Joe Gold, the owner of Gold's Gym said, you know, you have to pay for a membership pretty soon, Tom. I'm like, oh, Joe, look, I don't have any money. I didn't. I was a broke bodybuilder, like most guys. And uh, 
He goes, after the Mr. Universe, we'll talk. I said, okay, great. It's a few weeks to go. I won the Universe, and I came back after the Acapulco Mr. Universe. Mike Menser won the heavyweight class. I won the middleweight class. A guy named Carlos Rodriguez won the lightweight class. They're both dead. They both died, uh, which is sad, but true. But Joe Gold said, Tom, come here. I'm like, oh, no, he wants some money. I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do? Okay. And he goes, welcome to the club. He called Arnold up. He called Frank Zane. He says, Tom's one of us. He never pays for nothing, ever. And I walked in that gym. Any kind of clothes I wanted, anything I wanted was mine. Any friends I brought in, they gave him stuff. And I'm like, I was welcomed to the family, so to speak. And I'll never forget that. Joe Gold really, you know, I mean, nobody does this. Alone. Nobody does anything alone. I had a lot of support from ex-wives, <laughs> and, but Joe Gold was extremely success, helpful uh, in, my, in my life and uh, really gave me an opportunity, as Joe Weider did and everybody, okay? You know, and we don't do anything alone. There's always a support group around you. But that's what brought me here. And in a roundabout way, I wanted to share some of my immediate feelings with you to let you know where I was and why I'm here and what I'm doing. And uh, I invite you to really take me where you want to take me. I can talk for three hours. I have my own agenda, my own thing. I, you know that, okay, that's, Chris Dickerson always said, you have the gift of gab. I said, thanks, Chris, I, I guess that's a compliment. I don't, I don't know, okay? But I can talk, which is, I think, important in this business, because most guys walk around with food bags and they don't talk and they stay home and they eat six, eight times a day and they get up in the middle of the night and eat and nobody talks anymore. I'm like, what's that about? In fact, people live in their apartments and they, they don't know how to talk anymore. They, but they're on Facebook a little bit or Instagram, okay? That's, that's social, socialization today. But in my, in my day, when I was being tutored by Arnold and Frank Zane and, you know, and Dave Draper and uh, Ferrigna, it was like bodybuilding, you had it all. It wasn't about deprivation and pain and punishment. It was about abundance and prosperity. Arnold taught me, hey, this is America. He said to me, this is America. You can do anything you want. He, he said, let me show you. So anything he did, I did. He had a blonde girlfriend. I had a blonde girlfriend. He, ate, he ate, drank coffee. I drank coffee. Life was big. He, he, life was supposed to be big and full. That's what he taught me, coming from Austria. He was speaking German, barely spoke speaking English. So I've adopted those values. But it took a guy from Europe to tell me that about America. I didn't know that. I didn't understand capitalism. I thought, okay, fine, I'll just fit in somewhere. And, but being around the influence of all those guys I mentioned, a lot of the women too, I learned a lot from a lot of the women. The women taught me how to pose, they really did. Okay, how to, I wasn't a poser. How am I gonna, I'm not, I'm the short, stocky kid. But they taught me about the hair and stuff like that. And, and you know, I never knew what they were talking about, but they eventually showed me. But I'm here because of a lot of support. I'm here because a lot of people helped me and showed me the way and gave me the opportunity. Uh, and that was the unlikely winner. Almost everybody's an unlikely winner. They're not supposed to be the guy or the girl, you know? Everything, I could have looked at all the, possible, all the negative situations in my life, but, you know, I wasn't the chosen one. I wasn't chosen to be this guy and to be in the weeder camp or whatever. But uh, I wanted it so bad. In fact, the only difference between most of you and me, the only difference between me and you is I wanted it more. I wanted it more. That's the only reason I'm sitting here. And, you know, I'm, I'm nobody special. Yeah. Yeah. Third place, yeah, third place, 1981. Chris Dickerson was in second. Everybody forgot about Chris. Yeah. First place was Colombo. Colombo, yeah. Well, people are still talking about this show 35 years ago. People st they want me to do interviews on Facebook. I'm like, 35 years ago was a show. You still want me to do an interview about this damn show? Okay, I will. I will. I have, I have some viewpoints too, you know. Okay, when, when I was interviewed, immediately after taking third place, a guy named Ricky Wayne, you maybe remember Ricky Wayne, he, he, 
he came up with a microphone. Remember that name? Ricky Wayne, he, when he, Car Car Caribbean. He went back to the Caribbean. I don't know what he, running for office or president or something, I don't know. But uh, him and his girlfriend, May Malika. May Malika was a really sharp fitness girl back in 35 years ago, okay? No, no, I'm not even, no, no, many of you don't know who she is or who he was, but he put a microphone in my face and he said, Tom, what do you think about the Olympia? How do you think you should have done? Did you, is third, what do you think about placing so low, third place? And I said, oh, first of all, I think Franco is a great champion, and Arnold is a great champion. I think tonight, I think tonight, Franco should have placed a little lower, and I should have placed a little higher, but thank you very much. I'm proud and honored to be here. People, my God, he's a politician, you know? I, I didn't plan on saying that. I didn't have any pre, I just happened to react that way. I thought, hey, if I'm gonna stand on the Olympia stage, it's a matter of opinion who wins. Franco and I argued about that, but it's a matter of opinion who wins, who wins. It could be political, sure. Politics are in everything. We're talking about this last night, Kathy, you know? Politics is life. There's politics in everything, okay? You can, make it, you can, you, you can use it to work for you or it's gonna work against you. Done. I mean, you can't be upset about it, okay? I lost the Olympia, but did I? I mean, I came in third, and people think I came in second all the time. They forgot about Dickerson. But it, it was really, the, losing that show was the best thing that ever happened to me. Losing the 81 Olympia was the best thing that ever happened in my career. You know, and I, I, I didn't realize that until now, 35 years later, you know? I mean, what, would I have won the trophy? The trophy would have been in my storage container in Hungary, probably, and I'll be like, what am I gonna do now, you know? I would tr gladly trade the, the Sandow for a job like I've had in the last 35 years, okay? It's been a gift. Okay, I mean, God gave me a gift, as he gives us all gifts. And I think we're all good at something. We're all good at something, really good. Uh, and I think if you're really still, if you make yourself really still and quiet, which is hard to do in this day and age of social media, okay, Facebook and Instagram, but if you're really still and quiet, if you can be quiet for a half hour without, like, meditation, you know, you sort of the answers will come. You know what to do. You really know what to do, as you did with your gym. Even if you make the wrong choice and do something that you think you should do, you get in this, life will spit you out and you get another chance. In the big scheme of things, if you make the wrong choice, big deal. I wish I had one more life. I mean, if I had one more life, maybe a pro golfer this time. I have no talent for golf, but I know I could do it if I believed as much as I do about bodybuilding, I could do it. I'm one of those kind of guys that believe I can do anything, okay? And it gets me in trouble. But I, I, I made a self-promise to my, when I was a little kid, I, I promised myself that, that I would never leave the gym a loser. I was playing football as a teenager. I never told anybody this, but this coach kicked me in the butt. I mean, back in the 70s, you could do this and you didn't go to jail, okay? But the coach, he, I, I was playing football, I was a middle linebacker, he goes, boom! He goes, Platts, you're nothing, you'll never be nothing. I'm like, my whole world, Oh my God, my coach told me, Coach Smith told me I'll never be nothing. From that day forward, I made a promise that I will give it everything I got. I'm ready to die for what I had to, had to succeed. I have to give it everything I got. And that way I'm a winner no matter what. I don't know why I said that to myself, but I made that self-promise. Years later, 20, 30 years later, all of Coach Smith's kids uh, you know, they, they, we, emails just came out. This, the, the, the internet just opened up. And they said, are you the same Tom Platts that Coach Smith talks about? And I said, yes, I am. And tell him, thank you very much for everything he's ever done for me. Okay? So life offers you a lot of opportunities. Even sometimes if it's devastation and terrible. Oh, my God. Death and you lose your fiance or, you're, you know, your divorces. I went through all that stuff. Okay? Those are the years I did best. In 81, my fiance got together with my, I didn't ever tell anybody this before either, but she got together with my training partner. And I came home from the 80 Olympia and they're together, I'm like, oh my God. I was so hurt and so baffled that this girl could do this to me. I decided to take all that energy and put it into the gym before the 81 Olympia. I just opened a door to the Gold's Gym that day, that year, and boom, everything would work. It was a magical year. Any exercise I did was, wow, mind blowing. Every, and I, I would train like every day, and every day look better and better. I'm in the mirror, I'm scared of myself in the mirror, you know, because I was so focused on this. It was, I had the opportunity to be very selfish at that time, 
and you got to be selfish at times. And I did, you know, but the fact that, that something really devastation, devastating happened in my life gave me the opportunity to have something great happen. And I think that's the way it works. You got to have good and bad. In life, there's good and there's evil, and there's good and bad. And a lot of times, when evil, heavy, evil, and heavy, terrible things comes along in your life, it's really an opportunity. And everything I looked at in my life that's been bad, or like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I think back now, it gave me a, an opportunity. Pro opportunity is disguised as problems. Okay, if you don't have problems, you don't have a life. Everybody has problems. In fact, the more money you have, the more problems you have. The more money, the more stuff I had, the more, the more problems I have. Versus having no money and no life, you're pretty a lot of problems too. Living on the beach, you know, with a lot of guys I know, okay? Somewhere in the middle seems to be the happiest for me. I have a problem in big finance, big business. I, in the gym, we do things because we can. We add 20 kilos to each side of the bar because we can. Sometimes it gets us in trouble, adding too much weight too soon. In business, big finance, sometimes you do things because you can, not because it's right. And I found it's the same kind of mentality. But I'm here to tell you the energy that worked in the gym did work in the rest of my life too, but I decided to come back because this is my church. This is my home. This is what's given me life. And you get to a point when you get older, you want to give back to something that's given you so much. So that's where I am. Thank you for your question. Hope I answered that okay. Sir. I have a sort of question. You said it's not about the genius, right? Yeah. So, but you, you had incredible legs. So, not initially. Initially, I did. I mean, I, I responded. So, what was the point that somehow this was a strength? I remember people criticizing me at the old Gold's Gym, the first Gold's Gym. I was squatting for reps, some pretty good weight. People say, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't squat like that. It's bad for you. I'm like, I know, thanks. Keeps, kept squatting. I didn't, I didn't want to listen. I was like, I have to do this. Because nobody else did. And I felt so good. I didn't like squatting that much. I didn't like squatting at all, to tell you the truth. It's scary. And your hands sweat and you get nervous. And <laughs> you, know, you get kind of like anxious. But I love, I'm addicted to the feeling afterwards. After a squat workout, doing 500, 400 pounds for reps, and your life passes in front of your eyes and you succeed. It's like, I, life is great. The sky is blue, the grass is green, and life is absolutely wonderful. I'm in a great mood for a week later. I just, I wish I could squat more often, but that, it gets me in a great mood. And that's the reason I squat. The leg thing, uh, I mean, people used to store all the old benches in the squat rack at the old golds. Arnold and uh, Corny. Uh, Ed Corney did that squat thing for pumping iron, but nobody ever squatted, really. They would do 15 maybe reps or 10 reps of 315. Maybe they did it for the movie. Okay, nobody ever squatted, really. Draper, Z Draper put on 405. Even Zane did 405 for 10, but they never really squatted, really. Okay, uh, And so I took all the old benches where they stored them in the squat rack, and I started using it on, you know, on a regular basis, and I was ridiculed for it. I was told it wasn't right. You shouldn't do that. Uh, as most people are. When you do something that's against the grain, it's not popular, you're told you're doing it wrong, you shouldn't do that. It's just now people are saying your training methodology was on point. And you know, it's just now, 35 years, it took, took people to say, hey, he was actually right about what he was doing. And I don't care, I didn't care about who thought what. I didn't care who thought, I didn't even, I didn't, I didn't want to please the judges. I didn't care about the judges in the Mr. Olympia contest all those years, those 10 years. I just wanted to go to the gym and express myself from within, as any artist does. Okay, that was my, my, I wanted to go on stage and humbly show everybody how it goes according to me. I wasn't about to, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Hell with that. Let me show you what I've done. Okay? And that's what I tell actors when I coach actors. Go to the audition. Just show them how it goes according to you. Make a decision and go with it. And a lot of times the director will say, I like the way you did that. Oh, that's a good idea. Can you do it my way once? I like your idea better. You've got to be creative from that standpoint. Being creative is the highest level of existence. Following the rules and being a soldier of life is boring. I break the rules. I've always broken the rules. It's got me a lot of trouble. Arnold showed me that. Got him in trouble too. Okay? But you've got to have that personality. You've got to have that. You've got to be a little bit crazy. You've got to be a little bit. You've got to have an insane switch. And I'm talking, you know, I go to the gym. Insane. Click. Hi, honey. How are you? Good to see you again. You see, that, you see that same trait in everybody that succeeds. I have had the opportunity to work with billionaires. And being around a billionaire, I worked with Vince McMahon, the owner of the WWE. His best friend was Trump. 
before he was president, okay? I gotta be around, that's why I still wear my ties long, he influenced me, okay? But being around these guys, I'm like, wow, I'm like a student. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I couldn't, I couldn't have a better education on how to live life. And they all were very grateful, Trump and McMahon and uh, Arnold, grateful to what they have. Generous, but they feel like, you know, I would say to, I would ask Arnold, how do you, you're doing two movies in the same day. You work all night long and all day. Don't you get tired? He would say, no, I'm doing something that I've always dreamed of doing. People dream about doing what I'm doing. You know, they're grateful. And that's what I saw in Trump. And I think Trump is ridiculed. But he's put down, he's raked along the coals. But, you know, I, maybe 35 years from now, he'll be the greatest president of all time in the U.S. I don't know. I like his attitude, though, because he's not, he's not a follower. He doesn't care. He says stupid stuff. I know that. He's not a politician. He doesn't say the way things should be said, you know. And, but, you know, having known him before he was president, I'm like, granted, he was given a million dollars by his dad, okay? His dad gave him a million bucks and said, go do something with your life. He could have lost it all. He could have blew it, like many of us have, <laughs> okay? Um, but he made it grow. He made it grow again and again and again. He almost went bankrupt, like Weider did. Weider almost went bankrupt one, time, one year. Trump almost went bankrupt, almost lost it all. But they figured out a way to keep it together. And, you know, that's the kind of people I like to be around. I like to be around risk takers. There's a risk in anything you do. Any exercise that doesn't have a risk isn't worth doing. I'm not suggesting now that you take, commit suicide. I would never do an exercise that was outright stupid dangerous. I hear people that squat, that blow their intestines out. I'm like, what are you? I mean, how much weight are you squatting way too soon, too much weight, you know? I don't ever want to kill myself, but there's a risk involved in any success venture where, with the expectation of success. There's a success and a risk. The higher success goes, the risk follows. If there's too much risk, not enough success, I don't take it. I don't take that risk, okay? But to answer your question, did I answer your question? Yes. Really? <laughs> I'm throwing in some other things too, but I like when you guys take me certain places. I'll give you more than you asked for because I can. But uh, it's been a fun, fun life, and I'm not done yet. Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me, my English. Uh, the East Olympia in Sydney. Yes. Is a competition uh, for the uh, training system. Uh, Arthur Jones had a new team versus Ryder system and Schwarzenegger versus Mike Manson. Yes. So your question is about the 80 Olympia, the 1980 Olympia in Sydney, yes. Australia, and. Uh, Mike Mentor, Arnold? Yeah, I've heard it was a fight. Oh, the yes. The two systems of the wider system oh, yeah. for Arnold Jones would now win Mike Mentor or Arnold Schwarzenegger. Was this a political issue? Well, was behind the scenes. Was it was, I was in the gym every day with Arnold prior to that 80 Olympia. I knew something was up. He was looking too good. He was looking too good. He was looking too good? He was really looking, Arnold was in good shape. Okay, so I knew there's some, he was planning on doing something and he's awful good shape for a movie. He was doing Conan the Barbarian. Uh, but in, the, in the backstage from Mr. Olympia uh, in Sydney, Arnold and uh, Mike Manzer and uh, okay. Moses Stuttgart, they had a big issue together. And, uh, I remember the fight. And when the yeah. There's always tension between Mike and Arnold. There was tension between those two, always. Because Mike would say, you don't need to train six days a week, twice a day like Arnold does. You only need to train two or three times a week. So Arnold, Arnold's methodology was being challenged in print in the magazines. Arnold didn't like that. Arnold doesn't like to lose. Arnold doesn't like being criticized. Uh, nobody does, okay? Uh, but I remember that, con I remember it was my second Olympia and I'm backstage and I'm like, this is, I'm in my second Olympia and these two guys are going to fight each other. I'm like, oh my God, I can't handle this. I'm like, get away from me. And I was like dismissing. I'm like, I'm going to go over here and warm up, okay? Because these two, two of the greatest bodybuilders of all time are getting ready to fight each other and people are holding them back. You know, I'm like, oh my God, this is too much for me. But uh, <laughs> I remember Arnold said something about Mike's stomach. Arnold said, hey, you have a fat stomach anyhow. And, like, and Mike's like, 
<laughs> like that. I'm like, oh my God. And I don't know how it came down. Mike, Mike may have provocated that. I, it's been 35 years. I forget exactly. Okay. Um, but, you know, in years later, they made up. They did make up. Okay. But Mike was the next Mr. Olympia. Mike was the golden child. Mike was senior editor in fitness of Muscle, Ma Muscle and Fitness magazine. He was an intellectual guy, you know, the intellectual bodybuilder, the very smart bodybuilder. I'm like, wow, how great is this? If Mike would have just said, Arnold, congratulations, good job, next year would have been his, or next year would have been his. In other words, he got upset and carried this bitterness and carried this anger with him everywhere he went. So Mike, as good as he is and as generous as he was to me and helpful and as a friend he was to me, carried the hatred of losing the 81 Mr. Olympia, 80 Mr. Olympia on his back. And I think that's one of the reasons it caused him to die. And when you carry bitterness, it's bad. It's like cancer. You know, it probably causes cancer. Your attitude, your negative energy probably makes your whole body do weird stuff, you know? Because if you, if you think bad and expect bad and feel bad, you die, your body is like poison inside. At least your mind is, and if your mind's poison, your body's gotta be, be follow. So I think that's what killed Mike, if I may say so. Mike carried that bitterness with him, okay? Mike was a great bodybuilder, uh, so, so was Arnold, uh, I gotta tell you that. Uh, I don't, you know, I, it's hard for Arnold to lose that year. He was one of the greatest bodybuilders of all time entering the Olympia after a five year layoff it's hard for him not to win. Granted, all of the judges were his buddies, his friends. Hey, but he's Arnold. He's going to have I, I, my 10th Olympia. I had all the friends. I knew all the guys on the Olympia panel. You know, they made the wrong choice. But what the hell can I, you know, I, I, sometimes I told him. I, get every, I probably guest posed for every judge 10 times in those countries. Okay, every judge is my friend. Uh, I didn't have the small waist or the narrow shoulders, but damn, I'm going to go on stage and show him how it goes. And nobody talks about presentation, nonverbal communication. Nowadays, it's all about the physicality. Everybody walks on stage 300 pounds of body weight. It's all about the physical. I think we forgot about bodybuilders today, forgot about nonverbal communication, going on stage and projecting energy to the audience. I never believe that, you know, I don't like to see bodybuilders ask for applause. How embarrassing. That's like the waiter or the waitress asking for a tip, you know? They give it, you give the waiter a tip because he's a great waiter. Wow, good job. Thanks for taking care of us, right? When Arnold taught me, when you walk on stage, just stand there. He always said, just stand there. Look at the audience and command the applause. Don't ask for it. Don't beg for it. But when they see you smiling without even posing, people are going to start, they're, they're ready. They want to go for the ride, okay? That's what Arnold taught me. I've seen Arnold pose in great shape back in the 70s, and I've seen him pose when he's fat. The audience still responded like he was in great shape when he wasn't in great shape. And that's what I learned. You got to go on stage. You can have the most muscle in the world. If you can't sell it, nobody's going to buy it. So in modern day bodybuilders don't sell it anymore. There's no, the human spirit is gone. It's the physical. 300 pounds body weight. Okay, let's go to dinner now. Let's go. Okay, it's back in my day. When, when Arnold was on the stage and, uh, and Draper and all these guys and Reg Park and Robbie and Zane and, and you know, it was like, we felt like rock stars. We felt like G Lady Gaga, like Michael Jackson, like, like, you know, Frank Sinatra. It was like, wow, the fans were crazy. In New York, remember fans were rolling down the aisles. They were climbing on the stage. It was like, we had to be rushed out of there with security guards. We'll get you back to the hotel, don't worry. <laughs> you know, now it's like, okay, I'm Phil Heath, made half a million dollars. You know, I'm like, I love Phil. Phil was a good friend of mine. I knew he was going to win. Seven years ago, eight years ago, I knew he was going to win, okay? I told him that. My wife and I told him that. Uh, but I think he, he did what Dorian did. Everybody copied Dorian since Dorian walked on stage and did nothing, did something we never did before. Dorian opened the door, off, door up for Big Beyond Belief. Dorian did something different. But everybody's copied him since. I'm waiting for the next Mr. Olympia not to copy Dorian, to do something unique and different to where you go like, I never thought of that. Wow, that's Mr. Olympia. And that's what I hope to see before we die, or I die, but uh, I think it has to involve not just the physicality, not being 300 pounds on stage, the quality, but it has to involve the human spirit. 
You have to get that actor. To be a successful bodybuilder, you've got to be the, the athlete, the actor, the diplomat, uh, and the businessman. Four things. Bodybuilders forgot about this. You've got to, you've got to be an actor on the stage. You've got to sell the muscle you have. You've got to give it to the audience where the audience wants to stand on their seats and scream and yell and go crazy. You've got to tell them it's okay to go for the ride. When you watch a movie, when you watch a great Hollywood movie, you become the actor or the actress. You're living their life. You, you're relating to them. None of the bodybuilders give this to the audience anymore. That's my criticism, if I may, if I, hum, if I respectfully may do that. But the actor on the stage, the, the athlete, of course, the, the diplomat driving from country to country, talking about what we love, them being bear orators, being good spokesmen and representing the sport very well. Bodybuilders don't talk anymore. They don't know how to talk. In the, N in the National Football League, the NFL and the, in the, uh, the, the NBA, the Basketball League, they teach young guys how to talk, how to interview. They teach them how to dress, how to be professional, you know? Bodybuilders are be it's becoming more and more and more of a working class sport, subculture. And I love bodybuilding, don't get me wrong. Bodybuilding is my life, it's always been my life. It's where I come from and I have the greatest respect for the sport. It's given me a life, a great life. And it can be more, it should be more. And you hope when you, get, when you get to be my age, you can dent the sport in some way and affect it positively because it's given so much to me, to many of us. And everything comes back, everything comes back. And I think that uh, the human spirit will come back on stage, I think it will. It's gonna take some of the guys like you, David, to bring it back, okay? Um, but that's what I see missing. I think we need less science. We have a bunch of science experiments on stage. Everybody's over 300 pounds, 3% you know, body fat. I think we need less science and more art on stage. Art being the human spirit that we miss, you know, you, you, we used to see on stage, which physique is coming bringing back to bodybuilding. The human spirit, if you will. I think uh, more art, less science would be a step in the right direction. And, uh, I certainly mean no disrespect to the modern day bodybuilders. I mean, there's some unbelievable talent and dedication and focus these guys put into it. And the girls put into it. Unfortunately, they canceled the, the Miss Olympia, which is, that's another, that's another discussion for sure. But um, I think we can do better. Bodybuilding can do better. I mean, the, the worst golfer, the worst golfer on the pro tour makes about a half a million dollars a year. The lousiest, the failure at golf makes a half a million dollars a year. Okay, now it's not about the money, no, I, and I said that before. But bodybuilding, you know, it's better, Phil Heath is more rewarded than anybody in history, okay. We can do better. We can do better, okay. And I think that uh, we need to train our young men and women on how to be how to represent. When I was working with Sergio Oliva Jr., I said, go and represent. Put the suit on, put the tie on, represent your dad. By God's sake, your dad was the myth, Sergio Oliva. Go represent, who I competed with in 84 and 85. Go represent your dad and the royalty of our sport. Sergio Oliva Jr. is the royalty of our sport. He's going to win almost all, always, even if he's not in great shape, he's going to win because he's Sergio Oliva Jr. Sergio Oliva's kid, child, son. The only guy who would upstage Sergio Oliva Jr. would be if Arnold's son competed, which is not going to happen, okay, as far as I know. So Sergio Oliva Jr. has the lineage, he has royalty in his blood, and my job as a training him is to pound this mentality into his brain, okay? And that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what I do, and that's what gives me life. It gives me life to revisit and re remember those old days. And I don't want to live in the old days. I want to live in the new days. The new days are great. Okay, but I have to go back a little bit because he asked me these questions. Sir. Um, how did, let's say, uh, react your parents to your, to your growing career? Or did they somehow appreciate it or say, oh, this is something strange you do? Or they are very proud? My parents? Yes. Oh. <laughs> At first, when I was a young boy, when I was nine years old, and I was in the basement working out, reading the Weeder book. My dad would take me downstairs in the evening after dinner. We'd read the reader training manual. He would, it would say, okay, bench press. You put the bar in your hands. And I, I couldn't figure out why my elbows were hitting the floor. 
I didn't understand it was a bench press. And so we, my dad taught me how to lift weights when I was a little boy. Um, I was fascinated by it. Uh, the, the, when I was in the store, I was in a bookstore, a drugstore. Uh, what do you call them? An apotheque, a DM. I was in the store. They had magazine rack, okay? I'm a nine-year-old kid from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm reading this muscle magazine. I'm like, wow, look at these guys. Dave Draper, the long blonde hair and the girl on each arm, a girl on each leg. And he had this weeder crusher in his, in his chest. I'm like, and then Arnold's drinking protein out of the blender on the next page. I'm like, what a great job. You know, I want that job. I show my dad, when I grow up, this is what I want to do. He's like, give me the magazine, put it away. Come on, kid, come on, son. You know, and I'm like, I went home. But I thought about it and thought about it and I thought about it. I'm like, I can't believe that. People do that for a living. People lift weights for a living. How cool is that? You know, Kathy, we talk, this is, you've been your life for the 35 years. I remember when you were a little teenager, you know, when you owned your first gym here, you know, this gym. Okay, now you have three or four gyms, right? I know, I'm just kidding. But um, that's how I started, okay? And my parents were at first sort of like, oh, what is it now? Because I was into building big cars in my garage. I wanted to have the strongest street car, you know, 427 Hemi, you know? And I was into music, playing guitar. I would go to the dances and play lead guitar in a band. It was, I, I, you know, I, was, I was into that, the Beatles and all that stuff. But I was never Eric Clapton. I could never play that good. Uh, cars were so expensive. The cheapest thing to do was bodybuilding back then. There was no sports nutrition. <laughs> it was cheap. You know, and I could get into the gym. I could sneak into the gym and train. And the lifters liked my attitude. And they taught me how to squat. So... When I, real, when I started competing a little bit here and there, some small powerlifting contests, my parents went to the contest and supported me. Uh, when I went to the Teenage Mr. America, I'm like, wow, the Teenage Mr. America, I want to go. My dad said, okay, I'll take you. I'm gonna, I'll go fly with you. I'm a teenager, I'm a young kid living at home. He said, tell your training partner at the gym, we'll go. I'll take you to the, to the Teenage Mr. America. I'm like, wow, how cool is this? My parents are finally getting on board, you know? And I think my dad started realizing that when I started asking him for investment advice, he's a finance guy. He was a coach, you know, one of those guys. He realized that, God, he's doing, he's, he's serious about this. This is his life. And he, I think they realized my dedication when they realized it was a, that uh, I could make money at this and get financially secure with it. Uh, they sort of enjoyed it even more. And I think they liked the popularity of it. They liked going to the show with the Olympia. Like, ah! They liked the fanfare and the, but it wasn't about being popular. It was about being, everybody in the audience was my friends. You know, these are the guys, the, the working class guys from back home. The guys in the gym that, that believed and they were with me. You know, and they were, back then I remember like, anybody didn't believe they weren't part of my friends. People that gave me the great energy, that's my friends. You be careful. If you surround yourself with people that are negative, you become negative. If you're, people, if you're around people that are, oh, life is bad. Life is terrible, you become that. So I decided to surround myself with the people that were always energetic. That's why I went to the West Coast. Being around Arnold, oh my God, every day was, let's go. Okay, let's go, this is America. Learn how to speak English, Arnold. Okay, I did, I did, let's go, let's go. I want to be governor, no way. He's governor, I want to be an actor, no way. $26 million a year, oh my God, $26 million per film, okay? <laughs> now, nothing you can't do. Nothing you can't do in this gym if you really want to. Nothing you can't do in this gym if you really want to. And there's nothing you can't do out there if you really want to. If you really want to. If it's like breathing to you, you'll find a way to get it done. So my parents realized that that was my intrinsic, innate attitude. I didn't speak like this as a child, though, okay? They got on board. And I, they loved to go to the shows. My dad, I think, was just going because my mom liked it. But my, my mother loved going to Olympias. But the audiences were never fans. The people, they were, they were my friends. And I grew up in a very rural working class neighborhood in, Detroit, in Pittsburgh, in Detroit. And all the guys from the gyms, uh, they, were, they were my, you know, that, that's, it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about becoming famous. It was just about doing something we believed in. And I'll, for some reason, I had this belief system that I had to, I had to take that risk and go out. And I, I, I thought I could do it. I remember being nine years old, looking in the mirror, going, Mom, I look like this, don't I, in the muscle magazines? And she goes, yeah, honey, you do, you do, <laughs> you know. But I, I believe, and it's hard for a 20-year-old, it's hard for a nine-year-old kid to look at Phil Heath and go, Mom, no way, no way. 300 pounds, like, that. let's do something else. 
that's the thing. They can look at physique guys and go, or bikini girls, oh yeah, I could do that. Bikini girls, oh my God. Hungary is unbelievable. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gorgeous, beautiful bikini girls everywhere. It's like the new beach. It reminds me of, it's, I think it's better. I think Lake Balaton is better than Venice Beach. I do, okay? That's why I'm there. But uh, that's my parents. To answer your question, my parents got on board and they saw what it meant to me. But it wasn't just a decision I made as a child. It was either be a priest, be a Catholic priest, or be a bodybuilder. It was, that's what I was thinking about as a nine-year-old, because I thought I should really devote myself to something. So the mentality I had going into bodybuilding was this is a life, this is a career. It's not I'm gonna get in shape for Facebook, I'm gonna get in shape for an Instagram post. It, I was willing to put the time in and spend 30, 40, 50 years in the business. That's what I wanted it to be, and you know what? It became what I wanted it to be. It became what I expected to have happen. When you believe something and you put the energy out to the world, to the universe, you get it back. I really believe this. I don't know, I, I can't, you know, I, I'm nobody special. I'm not, I'm not somebody that's, you know, anybody, any different, most of you have more talent than I do, okay? I'm not any special person. But I believe that if you gave this energy to the universe, it would come back to you. And I didn't have a plan B. I said, well, I sort of did. My dad maybe get my, you know, my, uh, degrees in college. I was a teacher. I could have went back and taught school. I was considering going and getting a job teaching after the Mr. Universe contest in 1978. I was at work. I was broke. I was handing out beach towels on the beach. And Zane took me aside. Zane said, Tom, wait. I'm teaching right now at Santa Monica High School. I'm a sci I teach science and mathematics. Zane taught science and mathematics at Santa Monica High School. He goes, the opportunity is to come to you. It's going to come. Wait two months before the magazine comes out. The phone's going to start ringing. Promoters around the country are going to start calling you. I guarantee it. You have the leg thing going on. That's, that's the thing that you should market your legs. I'm like, Frank, you think so? I didn't know. He goes, yeah, you have something we, never, we don't all have. Okay. He said to me, here's what you do. Here's how much you should charge for the seminar and the exhibition. Here's what you should tell them as far as getting half in advance. He, he, he taught me how to book my own shows. So sure enough, I was starving, ready to, I'm, I'm like figuring out how to eat tuna for the, for the next two months, you know, finding tuna, Friends were giving me some food, you know, I, I, whatever I could do to live in California. And all of a sudden the phone started ringing. Promoters around the country started calling me. And I'm like, wow. And then, of course, I sent out flyers with my picture on. We had no Facebook. I, Tom Platt's available for exhibitions. And I did exactly what Zane and Arnold taught me to do. And Aunt Frank said to me, he goes, now that you're Mr. Universe, you should charge no less than $3,000 to go somewhere. I said, really? He goes, yes, don't compromise that. You're, you're worth that. So I'm the first time the phone rang. Oh, hi, John, how you doing? He goes, I'm a big fan. All the bodybuilding promoters were fans back then, right? Which, we'd love to have you come to the Mr. Michigan contest, and we want you to guest pose for us and, and do a seminar. What's your fee? $3,000 plus expenses. Great, fantastic. Uh, all I need is, I just need half down to reserve the date on my calendar. Great, we'll send it right to you. I'm like... I made $3,000, one phone call. Oh my God, this is great. Frank, I called Frank Zane and said, you won't believe what happened. He goes, yeah, I told you, I told you. You know, now I was doing that 50, 100 times a year, okay, for 25, 30 years. And then other opportunities opened up, uh, endorsements and owning companies and I lost a lot of money and made a lot of money and here I am, okay, I'm still alive. Almost died in the process a few times, that's another story. But, it all worked out because of the, my belief system, and I believe you have to believe. You have to believe you can. You can. In fact, in fact, find your impossible. What is it you think is impossible? You could never quite grasp. That's what you, can, that's what you have to go after. You don't have a dream, man, you're, you're dead. Okay? It could be a dream of having a family, and having a nice, tight family, and, my grandfather made $3,000 a year. He didn't want a big, glamorous life. He came on the, he went on the bath, the, the, his porch, uh, and sat in front of his house every day after work, worked in a steel mill in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and smoked a cigar every evening. Life was great. Made $3,000 a year, had some beef for dinner. He came, my grandmother came from Austria, okay? They came from Austria, and life was good here in the U.S. But I wanted, my dad wanted something different, and I wanted something different, 
and I knew it wasn't going to be about following the rules and doing what I'm supposed to do. It was about doing something different and bodybuilding offered me that opportunity and allowed me to utilize my belief system that my parents did instill in me, that Arnold instilled in me, and for somehow God gave me that belief system. But the belief system you have to have. If you expect to lose, you will. I know a lot, of, a lot of guys are very talented. A lot of women are very talented, but they don't think they can do it, and they don't. Very rarely does a great genetic talent, gifted guy or girl, very rarely do, do they succeed on talent alone. You, you, mixing attitude with talent, oh my God, that's a superstar. That's Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson. That's, you know, Whitney Houston, even though she had some problems. You ever see a, this is right, another thing I, all the arts interlap, bodybuilding, music, uh, sculpture, art, paintings, they all interrelate, okay? When I watch a uh, famous, or even not a famous singer, belt out a song from the tip of their toes to the top of their lungs, and they, they believe in the song, they're, yelling, they're singing on, I don't know, Britain's Got Talent or something like that. Wow, I'm so, that's what bodybuilding is to me. That's exactly what bodybuilding is to me, okay? And that's where I come from. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, okay? <laughs> um, hopefully I was able to give you some insight into the mentality. Uh, it's a mentality. It's a choice. Every morning when I wake up, every morning when you all make up, you have a choice. Sometimes I make the wrong choice. Sometimes I do. Do you want to be negative? Do you want to be depressed or upset about something? Or do you want to be in a good mood and really going after what you want? Adam called me one day early in the morning. I'm like, I was in a bad mood. And I go, uh oh, I made the wrong choice. I'm like, okay, let's regroup. Let's, let's start over. Get out of bed again. And what's the first thing I can do? And I, I saw this on Facebook. And this, I think it was a, uh, the Navy. And when it, what do they call the Navy commander? What's, what's the, what are they? Or, I don't know. A very well meddled guy in the Navy. He talked about motivation. He said, the first thing you should do every day something positive. Make your bed. Make a perfect bed. You know, he was right. This is, this is the good thing about social media. And I make my bed. Adam called me and made my bed. Perfect. Okay. All right. Let's, let's do this again. And Adam, Adam said to me, you know what you always say to me? He goes, I said, what's that? He goes, you always said life happens not to you, but for you. He repeated it back to me. I'm like, Damn right, he's right, he's right. Sometimes the student becomes the teacher, okay? That's the best case scenario. A lot of you are in the gyms training people. The best situation in life is when you train somebody that becomes better than you. That's what you want. You want the person you train to become better than you ever were, okay? But that's been my life, and I hopefully I'm directing, the, I'm opening it up to your answers and giving a little bit more in a good way. After every Olympia, I said to my wife, let's have kids after the Olympia. Let's, let's plan on having, getting pregnant after the Olympia. Let's plan on getting pregnant after, that was 10 years passed by. And it was two wives. Okay, so part of the sacrifice or part of my mentality, and I have to take responsibility for this, we're all causative to our own situation in life, okay? As much as I wanted to say, oh, I, it was them, it was me too, okay? Uh, I'm glad I didn't marry the blonde beach bunny, okay? I did marry her, though. I did marry her. Uh, and I'm glad I didn't have kids with her because, you know, she had the drug-related cocaine issues, the whole social problem. I put her in detox, okay? Uh, I'm glad it just didn't work out after four years. That was the early 80s. Uh, the next uh, seven years, the Italian girl from back east who I turned into a Beverly Hills monster. Okay, her, her best friends were making, you know, $40,000 a month from alimony because they were married to movie executives and they got divorced and I was living, I turned her into the Beverly Hills person. Santa Monica now is Beverly Hills by the beach. I was into the stuff, you know, what can you, stuff is what the answer is and I believe that at that time. So my third wife, who I'm still married to, Cha, David knows her, she's the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, I'm much better with her than without her. Uh, I gotta tell you, she's everything I'm not. Everything that I would dream about as far as being a person and a spiritual individual and a, just a genuine person, she is. Um, 
I'm very gifted in that sense. She's very intelligent, very cerebral. She's a retired doctor. Uh, she's ran companies. Uh, exactly probably what I needed in my life uh, in, nine, in 2000. We were married in uh, 2000, September 11, 2000. So it's been 18 years. And I'm done getting married, okay? <laughs> that's enough of that. Um, but uh, that's sort of what happened in my personal life at that time. So I never had kids. I think about it from time to time now. I do. I go, got to be nice to have kids. It was like, well, sort of what I'm doing now is mentoring young men and women in, in business and in, ment in being a corporate recruiter and helping people succeed in bodybuilding and sport. Uh, I would like to have a child. If my son or daughter wanted to go into bodybuilding, I would probably not be for it. I'd be like, oh my God, let's do something else, okay? But if they really wanted to do it, I'd support them. I would, okay? Most actors say that, yeah? You talk to a famous actor, no, I don't want my kids going into the business, but they do anyhow because it's the family business. Um, so, but I do have kids in a way because my, my uh, Cha does have uh, a child from a previous marriage and she's 52 years old so you know it's not like I have a little baby but I have grandchildren from from them and so on and so on so we do have sort of a family in that sense uh, although one thing I look back and hindsight's always 2020 you can look back you go I could have should have um, I wasn't ready for that time uh, I wasn't ready to have kids and we didn't uh, and maybe it's good we didn't but it's never the right time I finally realized it's never the right time you can't plan that you just it's got to happen uh, sort of naturally, but uh, you have kids yourself? No. no? Okay. Um, but those are some of the thoughts I have now. I was traveling around the world. I was going to four countries a year back then in the 80s with my first and second wife. Uh, I was doing what I'm doing now. It's hard on, a, hard on a marriage. She sometimes would come with me. My first wife I proposed to in Germany. We are in uh, by the river. You said it was No, somewhere else. I forget. I forget. I feel like O.J. Simpson. I have no recollection. You know, really, I can't remember spending a first. I can't remember spending one day with my first wife, and I was married for four years. I have no recollection of ever living with her, ever being married to her. Wow, and you know, I just amazing how you can block stuff out. Okay, so I understand O.J. Man, if my wife was driving my Ferrari with some guy, I'd, I'd be there ready to kill him too. You know. Okay, anyhow, I shouldn't say that, and, you know, but I can relate to him. And he was the he was the Arnold. O.J. Simpson was in my neighborhood walking around. Hey, hey, O.J., how you doing? He was the, you know, the, the black guy who was living uh, a rich white man's life. If I, if I can use, if I dare use that cultural relation, that, that racism type tone, and it's not racism, it's just, I never even knew he was black until I thought about it. And I'm, oh yeah, I guess he is black. He was a guy from down the street, lived in a nice house, okay? Close to Arnold. And that's where I wanted to live. Of course, I, you know, I made millions of dollars and I blew millions of dollars too. I did. I got to tell you that. If I had to do it all over again, I probably would have saved more money. Um, but I blew a lot of money. I, you know, big cars, the big houses and stuff that's meaningless to me now. I don't really care about it. I'm, I used to love, I wanted to have stuff. I like nice clothes and stuff. But it's not about the stuff. Stuff comes and goes, money comes and goes, the way you affect other people. The way you affect other people, like kids or people, lasts forever. If I say one thing today that affects you, that affects your kids, that affects somebody else, your friends, and that you can change lives. I mean, Ben Weider was right. Ben Weider said it, we can, it's nation, bodybuilding is nation building. I'm like, back in the 80s, I'm like, what does he mean? What, what, does, what does that mean? But really, if, if a bodybuilder with the ability to speak can affect people in the gym, we can affect other gyms and other fitness people. We can affect neighborhoods. You can affect cities. You can affect countries. We can really change the way the world thinks through our sport, through bodybuilding, through being able to speak. And that, to me, is wow. The thought I just had is in 1975, Chevrolet endorsed the Mr. Olympia. Chevrolet, the car company, endorsed the Mr. Olympia. I want to go back to that. I want to see Mercedes-Benz sponsoring the Mr. Olympia, you know? Wow, like they do golf. I want to see the way golfers, you're, I was around, I worked with golfers. I sort of help golfers with the mentality and, and training and all that stuff. It's, it's, it's a wonderful sport. It's, I want bodybuilding to be like the PGA, to where golfers travel first class or coach or whatever, 
but it's so professional, so poised to go in the locker room of a country club is like, wow, life is good. Life is full. Life is rich. You know, that's what bodybuilding should be. Okay? Not about the money, but it should be about the feeling of confidence that we're doing something that's creative and meaningful to others, not just being how big can I get and how, how freaky can I get and have nobody really appreciate it anymore. Granted, art should bother people sometimes. Art should bother people sometimes. So in all due respect, current day bodybuilding as art is bothering me and many others. Everybody talks about the golden era. Everybody wants to go back to the golden era. And I'm like, wow, how do you know about the, you're 20 years old and you're talking about the golden era, you know? So that's another thing I try to, that's why I love Hungary, okay? Going to the beach in Hungary and to Lake Balaton is like, there's a, there's a love for, for, for bodybuilding and a sort of an essence of the, the spirit of bodybuilding like Venice Beach used to have, okay? And that's, I think Europe could be the next Mecca, okay? And in many ways it is. In many ways it is. When did I start going to Hungary? Oh, well, Adam, maybe you can answer that better than I can, you know. When did bodybuilding start becoming... You should, you should see the events they have there. What, the events are huge. When did bodybuilding start becoming popular? You're 33 years old, so you were, you were born probably when I, I did my first seminar here, you know. Recently, did it happen over the next five, over the recent five years? Yeah, 10 years? But it has the... the it's not really you don't think it's... No? It will be? <laughs> Adam always says to me, he said, anything's possible in Hungary. <laughs> he, he, he says, anything's possible in Hungary. And I'm like, okay. He's like, he's, the, he's influencing me the way Arnold did back in the old days. And, and you know, in Hungary, is, the doors are opening up to where there's so much energy with, within the... The super bodies. Big, great show. Tremendous participation. I mean, side tech is huge in Hungary. You know, it's monstrous. And it's like, wow, what opportunities there are for an old guy like me in Hungary. And, of course, you know, in Switzerland. I like Switzerland sexy. Okay, it is. I don't know if you guys know that. I mean, watches. Come into the airport. Beautiful watches. Money and chocolate. Oh man, it's a great country, okay? I mean, that's what I see. And I look outside the window at the hotel. Oh, it's, it's like Germany, only quainter, really cute. And you know, and it's like, I want to taste everything. I'm like, can I try that? Can I try this? You know, there's something about Switzerland you guys don't know how great it is. I want to come back. We're going to come back here for sure. Okay, sir. Well, certainly bikini is popular. Bikini is uh, very popular. I, I've, when I first went to the gold gym back in the 70s, there was no female bodybuilding. There was just, uh, it was a men's sanctuary. Gold's gym, the first gold's gym was a men's sanctuary. We went there and talked about our date last night and we squatted and we trained and, and there were two or three girls in the gym in the 1970s. That was gold's gym's membership. Lisa Lyons. Stacy Bentley. No, nobody remembers this. This is too long. The first, uh, first winner from uh, World Championship is uh, Lisa Leon. Lisa Leon, yeah. In, uh, yes, yeah, she was fantastic. Uh, and and uh, Femal Bodybuilding is a uh, winner of the CR of 40 years. 40 years. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. I think, in, in, in first, uh, at first I was uncomfortable with women being in the gym. Like, how can I train with a girl here being here? And then it became popular, and there were no, no women's restrooms in the, in the gyms. And then, of course, Joe Gold you know, made it to where we functioned together, and we trained together. And it made sense to me, why, why shouldn't it? But the sheer idea of a woman doing that was like, it's like, it's like a man doing a curtsy. You, see, you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, I couldn't quite put it together. But I've really come to appreciate the female physique, and you can look I think a, a trained body in men or a, 
a female or a male is, is beautiful. It really is. And when a woman realizes that she can look more like a woman through weight training, they get serious very quick. They get serious right away. And I miss that. And the women's bodybuilding, it's, it took different steps. I think it got into bodybuilding to where I'm like, it was just incomprehensible by the general public. Uh, I love uh, Lee, um, Linda Murray. Linda Murray is a great friend. I think she's the epitome and the beautiful, gorgeous woman. I know her husband real well. My wife and I are good friends with them. Okay. And I think she, she epitomifies, she's the epitome of what bodybuilding is for a woman. And Rachel, an old friend of mine, I traveled around the world with Rachel. Yeah, we went to uh, Japan together. We went to, we crossed the international date line together. We have a lot of stories, you know. Um, I traveled, uh, I think Corey Everson was a great influence. When I first saw Corey Everson, I'm thinking she has no potential at all for bodybuilding. Four years later, she was unbelievable. She had a great trainer, her husband at the time, Jeff Everson. But I think women's bodybuilding um, is undergoing some changes as the men's are. I think that uh, it will open up again. It will open up again. I think that Linda will bring back female bodybuilding. I think she's elemental in bringing it back. And I think a lot, a lot of the practitioners in women's bodybuilding want it to come back. But I think it's hard to really understand female, you know, a girl looking like a man. It almost has a transgender con con connotation to it, okay? Uh, although, with all respect, we're judging muscle, I know. Yeah. Well, if I may respectfully and humbly give my opinion, <laughs> um, I think men's bodybuilding is, is too much is always, too much is never the, the answer. Too much of anything is never the answer. Too much muscle, not enough quality is what I see in men's bodybuilding. And the women, too much muscle on a woman is, is hard to understand and fathom, even though it's art in some sense. I mentioned that art, the current state of bodybuilding, the art does bother me. Art's supposed to bother you. Sometimes good art does bother you for a reason. That's what art does. Art's meant to enlighten, motivate, or bother people. Sculpture, art, paintings, dance, theater is meant to, movies are meant to bother you or enlighten you or motivate you. So with all due respect, the art of bodybuilding, it is art, and it's bothering a lot of people nowadays. And the women are in there, and even the men. It's, it's bothering. Because we, as, an, as an analogy or a comparison, we used to be into hot rods, and that was bodybuilding, hot rods. Now bodybuilding is funny cars. We like and appreciate funny cars, but we want to go back to hot rods. Does that make sense, that analogy? I mean, I love the industry, the sport. It's who I am. It's where I come from. I'm just criticizing my own backyard. I'm criticizing myself. I'm not lending disrespect or ill thoughts to bodybuilding and fitness. I'm talking about what's inside me, where I come from, and how I view it. And I, I think that it will come, I think women's body will come back with people like Linda Murray, who's, who can provocate it, prov, you know, provoke it in some way. Uh, I think it's, it's a wonderful activity for a lot of the women to practice. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I think the men, the classic physique, I think that's the new door. I think that's going to open the door up for a lot, a lot of people. Uh, do I have the answers right now? No, but do I know, th but I can tell you one thing, things change, nothing stays the same. Okay? And I think the, the, night, the, the, the naivete or the, 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 the youngness of bodybuilding, uh, people want to go back to those times when it was simple. Uh, and I think that uh, we want to make it we want to portray the goodness of bodybuilding, the greatness of bodybuilding, rather than the dark side. There's a dark side to everything, okay? I mean, there's drugs in corporate sport. I mean, corporate, when I was in the corporation, you know, the caffeine and aspirin, not to mention, you know, cocaine and everything else. Does that make a CEO? No. Does drugs make a superstar athlete or bodybuilder? Is there drugs in bodybuilding? Sure. Is there drugs in sport? Sure. Does that make a superstar athlete? No. Drugs doesn't make a superstar. A superstar makes a superstar. 
I don't even think it's genetics. I often think, well, it's not genetics, it's an attitude. It's a belief system that makes a superstar. Granted, you usually do something you're good at, though. I wasn't, you know, you would do something you're good at, but I even think that your attitude will take you any, much further than any genetics. Your attitude will take you much further than any genetics, and I mean that. I mean, I could, I could look at Arnold's physique and sort of dissect it and say, well, that wasn't good, or that wasn't good, or that could be better, but he's the greatest of all time. You know? But you ever see his pose when back in his heyday? Oh my God. <sighs> my breath was taken away. I couldn't. <gasps> oh, oh. My God. It's like, you know, and that's life. Life is the moments that take your breath away. We all think it's about how many breaths we take is life. It's not, it's not how many breaths you take. Life is the moments that take your breath away. When I watched Arnold on stage back in the old days when I was a kid, it took my breath away. When I walked into the G Gold's Gym, my first time in Gold's Gym, and Robbie Robinson is underneath that, that light, doing a light barbell, and I'm like, you know, this light was magical light, this magical skylight. I'm like, oh my God, it was unbelievable. That's what, that's what got me in. And I was like, I, I decided that, that, that those pictures when I was a kid, those pictures that Artie Zeller took, Artie Zeller took pictures of Dave Draper and Arnold on the beach and Zane. And I had that picture on my wall, my office wall. I have a picture of Trump. Okay, I have a picture of Dave Draper. When, when that, that nine-year-old kid going, that's what I want to do, Dad. Okay? And it's been a great life. And, you know, I can talk about the dark or the negative in anything. Anything. I mean, money is needed. But there's a dark side to money, too. And we need, we need it all. We need, a, we, need a, we need a balance is what we really need. Okay, now balance is hard to do. That's my current daily activity. All the things I think about, I'm going to try to share this with you. Um, there's seven different facets of life that where I try to balance. Um, career health, finance, financial health, uh, family health, social health, uh, mental health, what you allow to enter into your, your mind. Um, what else is there? There's two other ones. Um, financial, uh, career, family, social, mental, spiritual health, and I mentioned I'm missing one. What is it? Physical health, yeah. Obvi most obvious one, physical health. All those seven things I have written down in my notebook, my journal every day, and I, tr and I can't... I can never seem to remember the whole seven when I'm asked to remember all those things, but I, that's probably why I have a problem with it, okay? But I try to balance that. I never had that balance. My whole life, I never had that balance. I had career health and financial health, but everything else sucked, okay? <laughs> if I look at my life. So my goal as an old man is to balance all those things. And every day, early in the morning, I take the time to have my ritual, right? Celebrate the, another day. And I take the time to think about all those things before I actually start doing stuff, before I get involved and we start traveling to the next country, and the next country, and the next country. But that's really what we need. And I really think this is a training camp for what's next, okay? I can't believe this is it, okay? And Steve Jobs, my wife used to know him. He called the house one day. This is Steve Jobs. I'm like, no way, who is this? A friend of mine, you know? Is, is Cha there? You know, they worked together back in the old days, and Steve Jobs gave her a new computer because her computer failed. But he talked about this before he died. He talked about, you know, how he has all the money in the world, and is that really success? And he, had, he listened to some of his final thoughts, just tremendously moving, and it, it just startled my life, okay? And that's probably one of the major reasons I'm doing this again and talking like this again, because it's time to start getting back to what I know best and doing things I know best that I believe in. And the church of bodybuilding. This is a church. These are all churches. That's where I, very spiritual. Squatting for reps is very spiritual. Your life passes in front of your eyes and you see God. You know, you do. In a way. Okay. But that's my mentality and thank you for allowing me to go in those directions. But your questions are very provocating and provoking to me and I hope you don't mind me wandering over all over the place in an effort to answer those questions as, as, as best I can. Okay? Other questions or viewpoints or thoughts? Sure. Um, 
where do you see the sport going? There's different new things like, thanks to social media, people don't need to win to get sponsors, and otherwise, winners don't get sponsors, and there's all these competing organizations and associations. You can speak about Starbucks and. Uh, okay. okay. So where do you see things going on the more? Well, social media. Social media is good and bad. There's a pro and a con to everything. There's a pro and a con to everything. A lot of people I know who come to the gym every day, they haven't done nothing. But they're on social media, they become internet gurus, internet champions. Never really competed, never competed in sport, but they're gurus. Even some of the ones that have won some stuff are making more money than most people in the industry. I'm like, what is that? And so I'm being persuaded and pushed to become a social media person, which I'm not, okay? Uh, I realize the importance of it. There's an importance to, you can share a lot of things with a lot of people, but in my day, we had to do something to become famous. Now you just be, people just do, get on Facebook and Instagram to become famous. So I, I think there's, you know, a downside to social media. At the Mr. Olympia, or any bodybuilding show, people post daily selfies of themselves. There's no mystery. We used to wait till Mr. Olympia. We couldn't wait to get to Columbus, Ohio. We would drive up from, I was in school, with a bunch of people in the car. Get up, we'd get to Columbus, Ohio, and like, wow. We couldn't wait to see the show, okay? It was fantastic. But we didn't see anybody for the whole year. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. We had to wait for the magazines to come out every month. Like anxious kids. Like, when's the magazine? Do you have the magazine? Do you have Muscle and Builder and Power? Is it out yet? Ah! We go crazy. I'd read every word ten times back to back, you know? I think that social media, the fact that it's instant, the fact that it's quick, people don't think in terms of devotion and meaning uh, to a anything to anything they feel entitled when I was a corporate recruiter the average 25 year old would feel entitled to a job I'm like if I had a job interview which I did I mean I'd be there on my deathbed I'd be in my best suit going I'm here to interview I'm er I'd be there early not oh I'm gonna cancel it's raining today you know so to get back to your question I think we're at a time when I don't know about other countries. I haven't studied other countries enough. But in America, most young people feel entitled. The, uh, what's, the, what's the word they use? Millennial. The average millennial feels that they should get a job and be given stuff. They don't have to work for it. There's no work ethic in America. Modern day 20 year olds in America, they have no idea what work ethic is. They expect it to be given to them. That's why I like Hungary. People in Hungary, it wasn't so long ago communism was popular, right, Adam? It wasn't so long ago in Hungary communism, communism was the chosen way of life. I think it was more put on top onto them. They didn't choose it. They didn't choose it. But now it's not communism, correct? Well, he... We're getting into a lot of discussions, I know. Like, wow, I wasn't even prepared for this. But I think, yes, it was put on them. They didn't, they didn't say I won it. What I'm getting at, though, in Hungary, there's work ethic. Some of the guys in the gym, even the bikini girls, man, this is an opportunity to become, to do something, to become good at something. And they, they, they go after it. I mean, the gyms, the 20 gyms, the Cutler gyms that I go to, man, they're packed with people that have great energy. There really is. The super bodies they have there, it's, it's, there's good energy. There could be, I could look at some negative too, okay? I can't, but I like that. And that's what I see in Europe, and that's what I see missing in America. Uh, I haven't really studied every country enough to talk about this, certainly not Switzerland. I've only been here for the last 24 hours, okay? But uh, things come back, and I think that in America, work ethic somehow needs to be instilled in young people, and I think it will, again, through trials and tribulations and problems, and maybe re-educating. Uh, in America, there's a big problem with that. But um, 
One thing I do want to share with you is that opportunities will always come to you. If you expect opportunities, and when they come, you see them. For instance, in 1979, in 1979, I made, I was, I made $40,000 my first year as a pro in 1979. I was rich in my mind, okay? And I had the opportunity. They offered me half of Gold's Gym for $20,000. They said, for $20,000, you can have half of Gold's Gym ownership. Keep in mind, there was only one Gold's Gym back then. There was one Gold's Gym. Ten guys, five girls. That was it. That was the fitness industry. Okay? I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm going to buy a Corvette instead. Okay? I bought a Corvette. Biggest mistake in my life. Or one of the biggest mistakes in my life. Uh, I bought a Corvette instead. And if I would have spent $20,000, half of my earnings that year in 1979, I would own half of Gould's gyms around the world. Okay? So I didn't have the business vision. I never had the business vision that a lot of guys did have. Um, Arnold was buying property in Venice, California, this dump hole in the wall place. The gym, the reason Gold's gym was in Venice, it was cheap, cheap rent, okay? Um, but uh, I never had that vision of how to purchase properties. 25 years later, I was asked to invest. My neighbor, my neighbor said, Tom, I want you to invest in my, my project. I'm starting a new company. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a coffee shop. I'm like, coffee shop? You can buy coffee anywhere. Uh, so I decided not to invest with him. You know what he car called his company? Starbucks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm like, I missed it again. Okay. I, I, I could never see the vision. I didn't have that talent, if you will. I couldn't s not smell that. Arnold could smell that. Trump could smell it. Vince McMahon, the owner of the WWE, could smell it. I had no idea what these guys were talking about. But opportunity is going to always be and come to you. And I think a lot of the young people need to realize that opportunity comes to them, but they, they have to work for it. They can't just expect it to come to them. They've got to work for it. When you're working hard at something, and what luck is, people say, yeah, you were lucky. <laughs> but luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I mean, I trained for years and years and years and years I wasn't the guy. I wasn't the chosen winner. I'm standing on stage and I watched Ron Tufo in 1978 at the Mr. America contest called, be angry because he lost. He called the judges' names and walked off the stage. And I'm standing there going, I'm the guy. Because he walked off stage mad and angry and called the judges, I don't know, bad names. In the early 70s, mid 70s, we were all on high fat, low carb diets, mainly because that's what Arnold said to do. Arnold, Draper, Zane, all of my heroes. I had all their pictures on my wall in my bedroom as a boy, okay? And I, they were all, we were all taught that low carbohydrates, low sugar was the answer and high fat was the solution. High fat metabolism. 1979, my first Olympia. 1980, my second Olympia. I decided that I had to change something. Because if I kept doing what I'm doing, I kept getting what I'm getting, and I wanted to place higher than Mr. Olympia. I wanted to win the Mr. Olympia. Okay, so I talked to this Mike Menser. Mike it was very convincing to me that a high carbohydrate diet could be conducive to me. I thought about it a lot. And I adopted a high carbohydrate diet, ate 300, 300 grams of carbohydrate a day, less than 10 grams of fat a day in 1980, and got pretty good results. 1981, same approach, high carb diet, high sugar diet, low fat diet, got in the best shape of my life. That was the answer to me. I thought back in 82, 3, 4, 5, 6, that I should keep doing exactly the same thing. In hindsight, hindsight's always 2020. I should have switched metabolisms. I think the secret lies in switching metabolisms, going from high fat metabolism to carbohydrate metabolism. Years ago, when life was about farmers and farms, during the winter time, you would 
people have fruit cellars. They would have special cellars. They kept the, the jarred fruit, right? They would eat the carbohydrates that they have, that they stored away for the whole winter. As the winter progressed, they'd run out of the sugars and the peaches and the stuff in the, in the, in the, in the cellar, the fruit cellar, we used to call them. And, you know, eventually they were able to function on fat metabolism the rest of the winter. Summer came along, apples and fruits were available again, and they switched, they switched to, sugar, to, fat, to carbohydrate metabolism. So humans responded because of the climate to alternating fat metabolism to carbohydrate metabolism naturally. And I think that's the secret to bodybuilding. We don't do that enough. A lot of people do, they, they, they focus on this before the show, they alternate different days, different weeks, but I think that's where the real solution is. If I had to do it all over again, uh, in terms of my nutrition, I would have switched metabolisms back to a high fat and back to carbohydrates more, more than just staying with one thought. Well, I probably would have looked at more in terms of years because I felt that being on a high carbohydrate metabolism for two years worked really well. From my point, my personal experience, most people think in weeks and months. I was more f successful in thinking years. I think a year, uh, two years on a high carbohydrate metabolism worked really well. And I think another, I should have switched to a high fat metabolism during that, during that interim, and I didn't because I found something that worked for me and I felt I'd do that all the time, but your body changes. And uh, that's some of the things I think about now. Um, Now, at age 62, I have a sugar handling problem. I can't handle a lot of sugar. I can't eat 300 grams of carbs every day. We talked about this this morning. I can't do it anymore. I can't. Not, be, not out of choice. If I eat 300 grams of carbs a day, I'm, I'm like dizzy. I'm lethargic. I want to sleep 12 hours a day. I'm like, oh God. I call Adam. Adam, I'm not doing too good today. I gotta, I'm sleeping all day. My adrenal glands can't handle it. My pancreas, uh, insulin sensitivity, um, thymus gland, which the medical profession will never talk about. I can't not tolerate the sugar. Sugar is a problem. When people get cancer, what, are the, what, what should they do? Might get rid of the sugar. I think a cancer, sugar helps everything grow, including cancer. Um, I do much better nowadays at my age, having a higher fat metabolism. 100 grams of carbohydrates a day, maybe. Maybe I'll push it to 130. With my caloric structure being somewhere between 2,000 to 2,600 calories a day. That's me, just for me. But it's, it's based more on fat metabolism, which I find is much better for me. I can think clear, think sharper than high carbohydrates, which I would, uh, 20 years ago, I would give you the opposite description. I would have said the opposite. Okay? But that's some of the things I've learned. And I think we're meant to, to do better on fats. I think butter, butter is essential. We forgot about, not margarine. Margarine has, margarine has a half-life of 50 years in the body. It, was, it stays in the body for 50 years. Who knows what else, it what, what happens. But butter does not, not have to be uh, broken down by the liver. Blood gets immediately into the bloodstream. Uh, my joints, my, my skin is much better with butter. I could get away with it when I was 20. When I was 20, laid the beach three hours a day, I, was, I could look good for most of my 20s, you know, on real low-fat diets, no butter, just sugar, okay? Uh, but I found nowadays I age a lot quicker with a more sugar. Now that I'm back on higher fats, I feel younger, I feel sharper, feel better, I can train hard. I can go, I was in the gym, I was able to touch 400 pounds for five reps in squats. I was able to do 315 last year for between 15 and 20 perfect reps. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go back to what I used to do. <laughs> you know, I'm not 30, man. You know, I'm 62 years old. Uh, I have to really f carefully plan to do those heavy squats. Very carefully plan. Uh, it's kind of fun. No, I never had a knee problem in my life. But yesterday, perfect, pure technique. 
We talked about this yesterday. We have two seminars tomorrow. Perfect technique. Modern day squatting, the technique has been bastardized, for lack of a better word. The technique is about a hip thrust. Take people using buttocks and lower back too much, not the quads. I believe in a quad dominant squat. The foundational movement, like Olympic lifters do, okay? The foundational movement of the squat in its purity, being a quad dominant movement, having the back not perfectly 90 degrees, but maybe four or five degrees off, is perfect. Most people who are fitness advocates nowadays squat some, somewhere in the area of 45 degrees. It's a hip thrust. They handle big weights, and some of the girls preach good buttock development from squats under those conditions. I get it. I get it. But I think it's much more difficult on the knees. I think CrossFit, as great as CrossFit is, and the unity and the family and the energy that they create within the CrossFit community, they're all hurting their, on their knees. Because I think it's easier to teach an incorrect squat than it is a correct squat. To, to really be a weight lifter, to learn the correct squat, it takes years. I've seen weightlifters practice their technique with broomsticks for years before even putting the weight on. What do I teach young men and women? No weight. Forget about the weight. The technique. Size and strength will follow. But what I've seen happen with squatting, it, originally in the 1980s, people lacked ankle flexibility, which limited, the, limited their squatting ability. Now I'm seeing lack of, lack of flexibility in the hip structure. In the old days, look at pumping iron. You see Arnold doing cable rows, he's bending way forward, way this way, way that way. He's doing T-bar rows, he's moving his hips. Nowadays, because of the pharmacology, because of the size of the bodybuilders, we choose machines first. So most modern day bodybuilders come in and use all the machines and don't use the free weights and the dumbbells and the barbells, okay, as much as they should be initially. And some of, the, some of the negative results of, of choosing only machines is less, less flexibility. So almost by necessity, bod, current bodybuilders and fitness advocates squat incorrectly, if I may say so. And I got to tell you, I'm not all that. Okay, I'm not. I'm standing on the shoulders of many great men and women before me. I was taught and had the honor of being taught by some of the best in the industry. Norbert Shemansky taught me how to squat the best, one of the best Olympic lifters in the world. In fact, he won the gold medalist. He won the gold medal in the Olympic Games in 1972, I think it was. But Norbert Chemansky, he was working in Detroit. I was living in Detroit for a while. My dad moved around, my family moved around. But Norbert Chemansky left his job and go won, he won the gold medal in the Olympic Games, weightlifting in the heavyweight class. He came back to Detroit they said, you stupid weightlifter, you left your job for two weeks, we're gonna fire you. They, left, they fired him from his job after he won the gold medal in the Olympic Games in weightlifting. He taught me how to train. Meanwhile, the super heavyweight winner that year was Vasily Alexia. They had parades for him in Russia, in the old Soviet Union. They had, he was a national hero, the parade, parades for him, you know? Uh, I wanted to go to Russia when I was a little boy. I thought maybe it'd be the answer too. But, People forgot how to squat. I think there's two things. The work ethic. Modern day bodybuilders forgot about, you gotta train hard. You gotta have fun in the gym. You gotta go after it. Most modern day people depend upon pharmacology. Oh, I'll take this and take that, I'll fix it. I think we're gonna have to go the opposite way. Less pharmacology. I'm talking about taboo things, I know. But somebody's gotta address this stuff. Somebody's gotta address it, and I guess it's me, I guess. You know, so that's some of the things I do address in seminar format. Not necessarily here today, okay? But uh, a lot of the modern day pros in Europe, you know, what they're, you know what they're telling me? And I'll even provocate this. Tom, we've decided to take less drugs. Thank God, less drugs. Back in my day, every Olympia that I competed in, I think I spent almost $300 to compete in every Olympia, okay? I would, what I would take is what the girls took years ago. I mean, you know, next to nothing. And I got great results with very little. More is, less is more. And I think that's where we should be headed and that's where we're starting. I'm getting clues to that's what the industry is realizing. But I think that, you know, 
all sport has drugs in their, and even the corporate world has drugs in, involved in, in the life of the corporate person. But drugs clouds things and, and, and causes issues, uh, I believe. But more importantly, to answer your question, I should sort of say on point, I think that uh, because of the choice to do more machines and less free weights, the main tools of our trade, the main tools of our trade, the dumbbell, the barbell, the main tools of our trade, we forgot about that and we're having flexibility issues related to that. It's like most personal trainers. We introduced the physio ball into the gym years ago, 10, 15 years ago, the physio ball, because most modern day fitness advocates were using machines. Now, using more machines, the, the, all the young men and women see the top pros using machines, they all follow suit and use machines. We're missing the things that create and enhance flexibility. Athletic function. Athletic function comes from free weights, the dumbbells and the barbells and the pulleys, the main tools of our trade. I'm sort of blending a lot of different, I'm taking your questions and I'm sort of going over here, bringing it back and I'm, put, I'm sort of thinking about a lot of things when I answer your questions. I hope you don't mind that. There's no, there's no one liner to answer a question. You know, there is no one liner. People want one liners. What's, the, what's that one line? What's the few words that can give me the answer? Whenever I work with a person, usually it takes me 50 weeks to change the mentality and change the physicality and the motor, motor pathway of a 30 year old person. To work with a 20 year old person, I can change it in two days. Okay, because they have no bad habits, if you will. Sir. So you talked about um, going into the corporate world after your bodybuilding career. Yes. And yes. I remember Dorian telling the story that for him, love things fell apart after okay. his career. What okay. Which way did you transition right away? Or was there a gap? How was your mindset after the years? What I want to tell you is my own made up story. <laughs> my wife will tell it differently. Okay. <laughs> there was a time where you got real depressed. When you lose something that was so important to you, and you, it was a personal choice, but it's time to get out. Nobody said retire. I chose to retire, but it was time. Every decade, a new generation of guys come up. I'm like, it's time to get out. Plus, I was still touring around the world, still guest posing, still showing my legs, and promoters were like, pay you anything, just show me your legs, that's all. And I'm like, it was time to get out. It, was, it wasn't, I, I lost the, the joy of it. The j sheer joy of going on stage. I was losing that after 25 years of doing it. So I decided to retire. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. It was a lot like Dorian, okay? And I know Dorian real well, but you, when you lose that, it's like losing your spouse. Or like, it's like losing an arm or losing a leg. What do I do now? Who am I? Who am I in this world without bodybuilding? And so for a long time, I said, I'm not even going to the gym. I said, why go? You can't really go there and do it. Why go at all? So a good 15 years, I didn't, I didn't see a gym. I didn't care about a gym. I said, that was the old days. That was the past. And eventually, I had no choice. I had to get a job. <laughs> okay? I mean, I, you know, I was doing some occasional stuff here and there, but I wasn't developed on social media yet. Okay, I realize the importance financially of all that. Yeah, I do. People were showing me social media. I'm like, was it, social media was growing. I, what's Facebook? What is Facebook anyhow? You can make money, you can Instagram, and you can have an internet, and you can push people to your site. And Okay, okay, okay. I wasn't that person. Uh, that's why I said to myself, I got to get a job. I got to get a job. I have a lot of degrees, but I never really have experience. Uh, and I did work for a short time with Trump and McMahon, yeah. But that was in the early 90s. Here now it's 2007. And you know, my finances are getting lower. I'm starting to go, oh God, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? Good question. I very rarely share this with people. So I got on the internet looked for jobs on, on what they call, what they call that, uh, Craigslist. Okay, I looked for things on Craigslist. I'm like, what's Craigslist? I don't know. But I looked at it and, and I started looking at all the jobs. Started interviewing. I'm like, whoa, I'm really out of my league. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have any skills. They would ask things like, 
well, uh, you know, what kind of programming, computer programming do you understand? Do you have the expertise doing? Um, do you have skills with, uh, I forget the name of the, I haven't thought about it, uh, various programs and uh, different things. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you, do you have, do you have experience, proficiency in this and this? And I'm like, no. As soon as I said no, I had no computer experience. I'm like, <clears throat> people would laugh at me. Are you kidding? You're an old guy. Next. And they wouldn't even say that, but I saw the look in their eye like, <clears throat> right. I don't care if you were Mr. Universe, who cares? We need somebody that can, can perform here in this industry. So finally, I, after interviewing a lot, a lot, I mean, every day for six months, eight months, I started learning at home a few things. My wife's pretty sharp. She showed me some things. I gained a little proficiency that I could speak a little bit about this is what I can handle. You know, I can handle these programs. Okay? And finally, he went into the interview and said, I can do this. Give me, a, give me an opportunity. Let me show you what I can do. Put me in an entry-level position. All right. They said to me, this, this girl, her name was Rochelle. Rochelle was gorgeous. I mean, dressed to the to tens, beautiful corporate woman, just a, just a hint of sexuality, but very corporate, you know, beautiful. And I'm like, she goes, I don't know what to do with you. I don't know what to do with you, Tom. I understand where you came from and your background. I did some research. People do research on you nowadays. She did research. I'm like, she goes, all right, I'm going to take a chance on you. She said that to me. I said, great. When do I start? When can you start? Immediately, okay? And uh, I was overwhelmed. I was anxious. I was sweating. My palms were wet, just like I was at the squat rack when I was a kid. The same feeling all over again. I'm back at the squat rack all over again. And, but I had to do it. I, couldn't, I, could, I had to figure it out. And I remember squatting for the first time with you know, Norbert Chemansky and all the big lifters. They would look at me like, Hmm. They put the weight on for me. So finally, I started doing things in the office, and a couple of key people really helped me. They did. They, they showed me. They showed me how to become faster and sharper and, and quicker. I practiced on my own time. I went home and I asked my wife about this and about that, about that, and I would ask people to show me this. And I, I, at first, I was baffled beyond belief. I'd go home going, oh my God, what am I going to do? I, I don't know how to. I'm not from the digital world. I have no idea. After about seven years, after about seven years, a long time, I got good. I got good. I was proud of myself, okay? But I'm, I'm, I'm like going in the morning. I get in early before anybody else came in, just like I did at the gym. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting ready for the day. Get everything set up and ready to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this happen. And, my, and I was a corporate, I finally got promoted to a corporate recruiter position. And I studied the mentality. I knew, I knew people. I knew people. I can, I can listen to people talk and I can interview them. And I had the opportunity now to do things in the corporate world that I was familiar with from bodybuilding and the gym, looking at athletes going, ah. And I could have got a job as a coach or something. I didn't want to be a PE coach. I wanted to do something where I was really uncomfortable. And I was. And I was. It was overwhelming and I could have failed. I did fail a lot of days. A lot of days I failed ridiculously bad, okay? <laughs> I did. But you know, what are you gonna do? You're gonna just stay down? This is what I said to Dorian too. You're gonna just stay down or you're gonna get up? The only difference and the only way to go is up. That's what the squat taught me. Once you go down, you gotta get up. You gotta get up, you gotta get up. So I talked myself through this. I'd get up, go to the office the next day. After seven years, I built up some proficiency in computer programs. I could handle an office environment. I eventually had my own office, you know? And I enjoyed it. I immensely enjoyed it because you worked hard at it. You worked real hard at it. It was part of who I was. So now, I did this video for Team Andro, okay? And boom, went viral. And that was just on a weekend, we did a, David and I did a video for Team Andrew. We talked about the squat. The, squat. the film went viral and I had opportunity to go work again in the industry. But I'm in my corporate world now going, hey, that's the old days. Bodybuilding is the old days. The corporate world is my new days, right? I'm starting to make some good money, enjoying it. But finally, I got to the point to where 
social media, boom, developed and developed and de I was, had the opportunity to come back to the business I know best. It was a, it was a decision I had to make. They want to stay in the corporate world. And I worked hard at being the guy in that world. And I'm 62 years old, doing everything I can do to run circles around 30-year-olds, okay? And I'm, I had to work hard. I didn't come easy. It didn't come easy at all. I had to work harder than I did at squat rack, which is pretty hard. I almost died a few times, and I thought about it, okay? But I'm thinking, okay, do I want to give that up, what I've gained here in the corporate world, to go back into bodybuilding? I made a decision to say, yeah, let's go back to bodybuilding. Let's go back to what I know. Let's go back to touring. Let's go back to doing things uh, in the bodybuilding business. Let's build, up a, let's build up a motivational library. Use the times you couldn't get up and you got up to talk about with people. Talk about those times. Hungary became available. Other countries became available thanks to David and Team Andro and uh, East Labs was helpful. My, my CEO, Dino, my CEO said to me, if you don't go back into the world you know best, that being bodybuilding, I'm going to fire you anyhow. I know he was joking. I came back after my first visit to Hungary for two months and Austria and, and, the U, and the UK and I came back to the office and I said, Dino, I want to maintain, I have to maintain global mobility. I have the opportunity to travel again all over the place and to go to different countries and be involved with bodybuilding. And I have to, I have to go, I have to resign. He goes, I know. I expected you to say this, okay? And so I had to leave the office, and pack my stuff up and leave. And it was, it was like, wow. It's like leaving the gym, going, I never come back. And I, that's, that's what I put in to what I do. I don't just get a job. I don't just squat for reps and oh, I can do 10. If I have 50 in me, my God, I'm gonna do 50, okay? You know what I'm talking about? I'm not talented. It was life and death. Either you live or you die. Which one do you want, Tom? That was the decision. In the corporate life and in the gym. But if you want something bad enough, if you want something bad enough, you can't let anybody tell you you can't do something. I'll repeat that. If you want something bad enough, you can't let anybody tell you you can't do something, not even yourself. A lot of days I'm like, oh, you can't do this, Tom. You can't be as quick as a 30-year-old on the computer. Bullshit! Let me show you, Alien. I, I would have arguments with myself. I could do it. People doubted me. I doubted myself sometimes, too. But you know what? I watched Arnold fall down. Nobody remembers when he fell down. When he was, you know, Arnold wasn't the glorified winner as he was in the first 70 through 75. He got up. I become a famous film star. He became governor. He kept getting up and getting up. I saw Trump do the same thing. I saw a lot of these guys I admired in business do it. And that's what it takes. To do anything successfully in life, you've got to want it as bad as you want to breathe. And if you want it that bad, if you're willing to give it that much, you get a big piece of what you want. And life and dreams do come true. Anything you want can happen and become a reality. I believe that sincerely, and I'll die on that thought, okay? And I say that not from something I read, that's from something I lived, okay? And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Sure. Um, you mentioned something um, after you retired, you stopped all Did you ever stop training? Sure. I didn't go to the gym. 15 years, I didn't go to the gym. At all? At all. I started running. Something was missing. Something was missing in my left big time. I knew it. I started running, and I was, you know, I had to learn how to run. I had to follow people, taught me how to run. And I, I could run 5K, ran a marathon once. You know, it's, I'll never do it again, <laughs> okay? I wasn't built for that. I really wasn't. Uh, I could get better and better and better at it, but I, I wasn't a runner. I wasn't that kind of a muscle fiber type. But I could do it. I could finish the races. I can get better and better and better at, at, at running. Um, you know, it was a trying time, uh, but I knew something was missing. I tried to replace it with certain things. Eventually, I started going to the gym once a week. On weekends, I went to the gym. 
I had some young guys. Young, one guy was 20 years old. I, I, I focused on working with him and his buddy, who's 19. I worked with them. Every weekend, we, every other weekend, we squatted. They were young guys. They started getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I started getting stronger and stronger. I'm, like, I'm revisiting the old days in my mind, okay? My old, my old bar I brought out of my garage, put it in the car, brought it to the gym. The old bent bar, you know, with tape on it and chalk and blood from the old days. That's, let me show you what I used to do, okay? And the flexibility was still there. I had to retrain myself to do it. But it was fun. It was exciting. The gym now was exciting to me. In fact, I remember going to the gym during that time going, and Arnold was coming to the gym. I said, Arnold, I think it's more fun now than it used to be. Said, yeah, but everything hurts and stuff like that. But it was just, it, the answers came to me. The more I looked and opened up my mind, it goes, I had no choice. It wasn't really a matter of staying in corporate life or coming back. It was just, this is what I'm supposed to do. Your career chooses you. Your career chooses you. You don't choose it. There's a reason you're all in fitness, okay? There's a reason. You were led to this. Just the same way I was led to Gold's Gym, Venice Beach as an anointed zombie. All of us were. It wasn't about the money. It was about training together in one gym. Fifteen people training together in a 5,000 square foot gym. That was the fitness industry back in 1975, okay? And so you're here not by choice. You're led to this. And I believe we all have a destiny. We're all supposed to do something in our lives. But all of you are good at something. I know you are. Okay? So I can see the smiles on some of your... Yeah, for sure. Just expect big things. Think big. Think big. You can do it. You can do it. Why, why can't I do it? Take a little bit of piece at a time. Have daily goals, monthly goals. But you can make it happen. It can happen. What's impossible in your life Go after that. Have that. Go after what's impossible. You gotta have something impossible in your life. I used to think it was a blonde girlfriend. She's impossible, I could never have her. Okay, Arnold, I did it, okay? What's next, okay? Goals are important. Passion is important. Waking up in the morning and having an excitement about the day is important. That's what I learned through those times. I never had to get a job. I was, all of a sudden, I won the Mr. Universe and bam, like Zang told me, I had a job for 25 years, making big money, stupid money. I, what, what I did in my 30s, close to 40, or in my 40s, is what most guys and girls do in their 20s. But I didn't want to go to Arnold's office and say, give me a job. You know, I wanted to go... What's it really like to be a regular working guy interviewing for a job? Not having somebody know my background. What's it like? Wow. And the same attitude in the gym, as I mentioned here two hours ago when I first started the seminar, worked in the office. The same energy, the same attitude. Attitude monitors talent. Attitude will take you further than any talent or genetics you have. Okay? Attitude is everything. That's the one thing that I know. I don't know a lot. That's what I know. Okay. Any other questions? I hope I answered the question. Okay, sir. Um, I was it for you when you talked your biceps? Yeah. This was a uh, yeah. very big story at this time. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I was training and uh, I was training for the 81, 82 Mr. Olympia. The 82 Mr. Olympia in London now was mine, okay? It was two weeks to go. I'm doing flies and whoosh, whoa, what's that feeling? You know, sometimes in the gym you have funny feelings. My bicep tore off the bone. The, the attachment site, it tore right off. So I went to the doctor right away. He said, completely torn. You can't train for the Olympia. I don't want that. I can't, take, I can't handle that answer. Went to the next doctor looking for a different answer. I said, okay, what happened? He goes, completely torn off the bone. He goes, if you think you can train for the Olympia, go ahead. I'm like, wow, that's all I needed to hear. That's all I needed to hear. I can still train for the Olympia. Two weeks to go. I can't use my bicep at all. So I called Mike Menser. I said, Mike, show me how to use these stupid Nautilus machines where you don't have to use your biceps. You can sort of you know, do pullovers like this without your biceps. 
Mike was kind of set down with me in the gym. He goes, he showed me everything I could do in the gym without using my biceps. Uh, but went to the 82 Olympia in London, he'd starting to roll up. I could hide it perfectly. Nobody knew what happened, but I, I made the mistake of telling somebody. I told Arnold, and Arnold told the judge, and this judge told that judge. So when I went on stage, Tom, can you walk forward, please? Can you show me your left bicep? Oh my God, okay, it's, it's over. I can't hide it, okay? So I decided to uh, guest pose um, at the next few pro shows. One was in Sweden. Those leg shots you see are the, actually taken in, in Swiss, Sweden, okay? Um, but I had some great influence during my career. I really have, okay? And I used that down negative time. He had magazines this morning. We had breakfast together, Franco. He had magazines from the old, I forgot about this. I, I was in the hospital with a big cast on. Can he make it back? Can he? I used all the, the Rocky theme. I used all my problems in the magazines and created the whole, can he come back to train again? Can he do it? You know, and I, took, I, had, I had photographers come to, Weeders photographers would take, came to the hospital, took pictures of me in the wheelchair and all that stuff. It worked for Arnold back when he had his knee issue, his knee problem back in South Africa, okay? But uh, my mentors were always Arnold, obviously. Arnold was extremely influential to me. Um, and Dave Draper. I don't know if maybe a lot of you don't know Dave Draper. Dave Draper was the blonde guy. Dave Draper who did TV. He did the, uh, a lot of the movies with Tony Curtis and back in the 60s. Dave Draper was the Arnold before Arnold, okay? But Dave was embarrassed to be a bodybuilder. Dave didn't like being so popular. Dave had a Hollywood, he, he was being, going out with Sherman Tate was his girlfriend. He was touring the world as a film actor. He decided he didn't like being famous. He went to the Santa Cruz Mountains in California and became a hermit. I go, I can't do that. Arnold's a Terminator in real life, you know? And he could, in life he's a Terminator. I'm like, I can't do that either. Somewhere in the middle. So those two guys influenced my career dramatically. That's re really, 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 all my teachers I'm a product of. When I watched Robbie going from exercise to exercise, he was like an animal in the gym. Like what style, what class, the way he moves. I'm a stocky jock from back east. The way that Zane moved. Zane would do sit-ups. Zane would do one set of sit-ups for an hour without stopping with the sunglasses on. I'm like, my God, what planet is he from? I'm like, my God, this is unbelievable, this gym, okay? I was like, so I'm really, I'm really the product of Arnold and Draper, but I'm a product of Ferrigno, Serge Nubre, Robbie, a uh, little bit of Ed Corny, uh, all the guys that took me under their wings and said, let me show you the way, kid, okay? Uh, I can remember Serge Nubre's skin in 1978. Surgeon who braised in the gym, like, look at the skin on this guy. Look like, look like saran wrap for skin. Beautiful skin. I'm like, how do you do that? And then pretty soon, the girls taught me how to pose. You know, I'm like, oh, what, what do you mean I do? What do I do with the hair? Teach, teach me. What are you talking about? I like the thing you do with your hair. Because like, I wasn't a poser. So really, I'm the sum of a lot of people. Okay? And I'm standing on their shoulders. So when I talk to you, you know, I'm not all that. I had some great teachers, some wonderful teachers that I thank God were in my life. Having said that, I think that's probably long enough. Uh, it's about two and a half hours. Thank you all so much. We'll st uh, thank you all so much. We're going to stop. Well, take like a little break and we have some pictures and stuff like that and some individual discussion. But thank you all very much for being here and for giving me your attention and prov provocating those ideas and thoughts. I told you I'd tell you what was really on my mind and I always like to do that. Um, but anyhow, thank you all very much for your energy. With y'all, your energy, I gotta tell you, without your energy all those years, I never could have done it. I just wanna be able to give it back to you and say thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>